The poem we're going to be looking at now is a poem, The Garden of Love by William Blake. And it's quite a difficult, interesting, but when we get down to the basic idea of the poem, um, should be pretty straightforward. But there will be certain things I need to focus on with regard to um, the Garden of Love. And I think very importantly, we need to look at some of uh, William Blake and what he is about in terms of understanding this poem. So I'm going to take you through some ideas to work with before. So from London, 1757, poet, art, engraver, mystic. So he had kind of like visionary ways of looking at the world. And he, he really uh, tried to look at uh, quite abstract ideas around the time of, of when he wrote his poetry um, and quite a, like deep, big ideas. Okay. Um, lyrical, prophetic. There's a lyrical feel that comes to almost song-like. Indeed, some of his anthologies are called Songs of Innocence, Songs of Experience. Um, his poems, this is very, very critical. His poems often commented on the social injustices of the time, okay, specifically the church, the monarchy that refers to at the time the um, I think the king and then the queen, child labor, etc. But this kind of is important here, this antagonism towards the church. Okay, and I need to say, I'm going to say it again and again, this poem is not attacking religion or Christianity as such on its own. It's not like an anti-religion poem, anything but. Okay, rather he's criticizing a certain way that it is being practiced or was being practiced in his specific context. So if you understand, he was making commentary around certain kind of like social injustices that the church turned a blind eye onto quite a lot of things, okay? And was at the time in England, specifically around the French Revolution and so on, um, William Blake found these kind of um, injustices occurring, okay? and specifically some members of the church overlooked. So it's not an attack on all religion or on Christianity as such as a whole, but rather on the way certain people practiced it. And specifically it was around how restrictive things were. So we know like with lockdown, there were certain restrictions, not so, lots of restrictions. You can't do this, you can't do that. And so on, but with, with, with you know, due cause. So in other words, that, that um, we, you know, it's for, uh, to, to prevent, uh, the in, in, infection rates of COVID um, of, of them increasing and so on. Okay, so, but um, certain restrictions are necessary. He felt that these restrictions were not necessary. So he rejected some of this. This point here is what I need you to understand. Some forms of contemporary Christianity, which focused on sin, guilt, fear, yet turned a blind eye on its own standards. Okay, and this idea of institutionalized religion, okay, turns the natural bond of intimate love um, into something almost like it's imprisonment and it engenders hypocrisy. This last point is very, very important for you to understand um, in terms of the poem. So that sounds very heavy. Sanctity is like deep spiritual um, kind of correctness and blissfulness. But institutionalized religion, like, in other words, focusing only on the rules and the structure and not perhaps the real messages within. Remember, he was again talking about a certain type of, of, of religious practice that focused only on, you know, you know, thou shalt not and you must not and so on, but actually um, didn't look at real redeeming aspects of the human soul. So I spoke about songs of innocence and songs of experience. And so it's just a little bit of like background to the poem because I think that it really helps students to understand what he, the kind of stuff he was writing about. And I felt that last year's, those who answered, for those candidates who answered uh, the Garden of Love for the 2019 paper too, they, the better ones that understood the context of the poem, context of William Bagg's poetry. So we, I'm going to rush through this, but you can spend some time researching and reading through this in your own time. So we've got innocence, and this defined here an innocent world, partially, it's short, it's simple beauty. It's untouched by sin. And the symbol of the lamb, okay, and um, specifically William Blake uses that kind of animal 
to show the innocence. And we also remember the lamb as in, as in the Christian um, symbol also. Experience the sufferings of the miserable, a fuller sense of the power of evil, intense sorrow, okay, bitterness, experience. And that's kind of like what happens in the Garden of Love, not so. I went to the green to play dot, 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 but then it changed into a world that was far more restrictive. And so I've got here the symbol, the tiger. So when I teach this more fully, when I'm teaching Life of Pi, I actually refer to this because interestingly, there is a chapter in Life of Pi that um, refers to the, the uh, Richard Parker as, as, as kind of like in part two, as, as kind of like almost epitomizing primal fear, evil, and, and the like in the, I think it's in chapter, um, I forget now, but it's in chapter, I think 48, no, 49, zero about, don't worry too much about that, but you'll see there is that, um, that there's descriptions of Richard Parker um, that we we find. Let's move on. We're not saying Richard Parker is black or anything like that, but I just I did notice the similarity. Okay, so society makes its fears, guilt, and shame into rules, which are then used autocratically by the church, the state, the monarchy. And that's I've capitalized it because William Black also capitalizes these kind of institutions as like having deep um, meaning. And other words too, you see, are capitalized. And there's a lyrical beauty that we find. Okay. So society constructs fears, guilt, et cetera, into laws and rules, which are then used autocratically by the people in power. Features of his poems, we find quite simple language, actually. Diction is quite straightforward in many cases. You look at the poem, The Garden of Love, there, isn't, there are not too many difficult words in there. It's just the strange arrangement that we might find as having difficulty. There are vivid images. Symbolism is often used as a bitter social construct. Uh, uh, social criticism, okay? And so symbolism we see as a seemingly simple idea concealing a darker set of truths aimed at exposing tyranny of the times. So simple idea in simple language, but is developed as, as um, a kind of con conveying a darker set of truths. Now, a lot of William Blake's poetry around this time uh, late 1700s, 1799, 1801, around the time of the French Revolution, actually these poems were also regarded in a way as protesting against um, like the government of the time and the king and, and so on. Okay, um, It is, I think it is King George. I'll come back to you on that. I'm sure it's King George now, now that I remember. Uh, Capitalisation to suggest an abstract idea. So we do find these words that are capitalised. Okay, and it's kind of re to represent not just an item or an, uh, an, an individual item, but rather an institution, a representation of, of bigger ideas. And we find repetition. So anaphora, um, words deliberately being repeated, or this big word here, polysyndeton, the compounding of and, sorry. Um, so we find repetition of and that compounds the uh, list of restrictions. So polysyndeton, another big word, and you can research this, as I say, I'm going through this rather um, sort of quite quickly. Uh, these are just some back, background ideas. All of these words you can find out more about, but the sort of deliberate forceful repetition to create a compounding effect so as to um, develop a, a, an important idea. And this very special word poly, many, and to do with the repetition of, of um, conjunctions, specifically and. Deliberately so, not just rambling sentences. Okay, rhyme and rhythm creates a song-like lyrical feel. Verb tenses are deliberate. Persona is created. Ah, there's this was sort of often there's this voice coming through that's strong, and punctuation used deliberately to emphasize tone. So just very briefly, this is I uh, just put, you know in in developing this. We look what is swan a uh, symbol, and we see these birds. It's a swan, not so swans are. We don't really find them in South Africa anymore. Um, but symbol of, as we've got here, love, or beauty, or grace. But we can also have personal symbols. When you dream at night, okay, you fall asleep, you dream, you sometimes might have them as craziest distorted images. So William Blake's poetry has both private or uh, sort of uh, conventional symbols and also private personal symbols that's developed. So we need to look carefully and read his poems carefully or read his poem carefully to establish a symbol. 
So let's have a quick look here. This is not part of the syllabus, but um, a poem you can explore in your own time. A rose, thou art sick, thy invisible womb, um, the, that flies in the night in the howling storm, has found out thy bed of crimson joy, and his dark secret love does thy life destroy. So we know that a rose is a symbol of beauty, symbol of love, but there's something here about the invisible worm. If you, you can spend time reading through it by yourselves and see that actually it is capitalized. And we see there's something about like, this could suggest in the howling storm, the invisible worm that eats the rose and it destroys thy life and dark secret love. Perhaps it's like maybe jealousy in a relationship or you know, um, other kind of issues that we may find. Um, so again, I'm rushing through this, but just read this as a as something, spend some time unpacking what this could symbolize. It is a famous poem by William Blake, and um, it's always good to get a feel of the language. Thou art, he dresses the rose personally, and uses these very weird abstract ideas to suggest a deeper set of, of ideas or, or um, um, experiences that one has. We've got roses innocent, but has become sick through experience. So I don't know why I think jealousy, but there could be a number of other, other um, very interesting interpretations that we have. Let's look on the poem, the poem itself more specifically. So I wanted to look just as I normally do, just look at the, um, so just to read through, I went to the garden of love and saw what I'd never seen. A chapel was built in the midst where I used to play on the green. And the gates of this chapel were shut. And we note that kind of prescription at the end, end, end. Um, and we see the, we continue. And the gates of this chapel were shut, and thou shalt not writ over the door. Okay, um, again, this kind of prescription um, that's coming through. Um, so I turned to the garden of love that so many sweet flowers bore and saw it was filled with graves and tombstones where flowers should be and priests in black gowns were walking their rounds and binding with briars my joys and desires. Can I just take that off there? Okay. Um, So we note, if you look at the poem, it's sort of three stanzas, four lines each. It's not a sonnet. Wherever that comes from, in whatever notes, where sonnet equals forty lines. It says only twelve lines. So therefore, whatever you whatever you want to try read into the poem, in terms of any like three quatrains or whatever. Um, it's not a sonnet, okay? Um, the turning point is really, it goes far earlier on into the poem. Um, you can say one, two, three, four. I'm not even going to entertain. There's nothing here that says that it's a sonnet. Okay, so we're not going to engage that one at all. Um, you must be careful of the notes and so on that you read on the internet and read any old note and so on. Um, that's why we are doing these presentations to try to fine tune the kind of reading that you should be doing. We notice the number of capital letters that are used. We've got this and, 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 and. And if we look here, this joys and desires, like it's taken away, this freedom is taken away. And we've got this, I went to the garden of love and saw what I'd never seen. And line four really tells me a lot about the poem, where I used to play on the green. And green here must mean like innocence and early joy and childhood memories. The childhood memories were sweet, okay? They were happy. There was like a sense of not, not caring about the world in, in a major way, that there was this um, freedom. But things have changed, okay? And now we've got this graveyard and tombstones and the priests in black gowns, dot, dot, dot. Let's establish one thing carefully now. Mm -hmm. 
there is no funeral that's happening. It's not a funeral service. Yes, we've got graves. Yes, we've got tombstones. Yes, we've got priests. But what are they doing? They're walking their rounds. They're not preaching. They're not giving a sermon. They're not giving a eulogy. They're not giving any kind of like um, anything to do, any last special last, last rites. They are preventing, binding with brows, my joys and desires. There's a monotony that occurs. There's something sinister with black gowns. There's something restrictive about the nature, not evil. Okay. They might not be doing the what they should be doing properly. They might be um, restrictive. They might be autocratic, but not evil. This is not about them being evil, nor is it about it set at a funeral. And we need to be very specific around that. It's about the restrictions that the church imposed onto the speaker rather than it being set. It's kind of like filled with symbolism. It's a sort of more set of like the way he responds to this world around him that has changed. Okay, it's not literally he now sees them at a funeral service and so on. That, that is not a correct interpretation or reading of this poem. That's when you read something out of context, we focus on one or two lines. We say, oh, graves, therefore it's a funeral service. We can go, I can go to a graveyard today and have a look at at, um, you know, I might want to explore heritage or culture or, you know, something, whatever. That doesn't mean that I'm not at a funeral, okay? Um, again, I want to be specific around this, where flowers should be. We're walking. There's nothing here that says they are sending someone's bo body or soul to rest in peace or anything like that. And look at the context of the poem. The poem is really about like this innocence of the past versus the experience versus now there's this, a new awareness of the world around the Pope that says, you know, um, there are a lot of restrictions of my, my freedom, my freedom of choice. We've got here, thou shalt not, writ over the door. Um, let's put that in quotation marks so we can actually see. I think that's how it should be. Thou shalt not, writ over the door. This this prescription, this commandment, told whatever the poem is not about attending a loved one's death or anything else like that he is i need you to read that um he is restricted he is it's, the context is much more about than um than you know and you can have priests at a church okay you have living pe pre pre priests residential priests or perhaps they're doing the doing their rounds it so happens okay um, yeah. Okay. So just, just um, again, just consider that, um, please. I want you to think about that carefully. So let's have a look at the poem. I went to the garden of love. Look at the innocence. Okay, the sort of happiness and everything else. And saw what I'd never seen. A chapel was built in the midst where I used to play on the green. Okay. Again, innocence, carefree. Okay. And the gates of this chapel were shut, closed. Now it's no, not open anymore. Okay? It's like a past is created, it's like there's a partition is created, plus also where I used to, you know, the past tense. Okay? I went, saw where I used to play, and the gates were shut, and we've got, and then what, what characterizes this? And the gates of this chapel were shut. Thou shalt not writ over the door. Now we're not saying we're condemning the you know, biblical commandments that say you mustn't, and uh, the, those kind of tools in which to live our lives, or at least which, which Christians live their lives um, as such. Or you know, it's it's a sin to murder. I think we we kind of like that's almost a, that's a universal that should that's I think in you know in all religions. But that's not the point here. The point is that it's not about those those rules themselves. It's a way in which it's uh, addressed, in the, the prescriptive and restrictive way in which you find the emphasis on sin, perhaps, okay, in itself, rather than on goodness and on wholeness and on other qualities, on virtues, on, on moral virtues, rather than on just sin. So I turned to the garden of love that so many sweet flowers bore 
bore. Everything's in the past tense. The sweet flowers were there where I used to play on the green. Not sweet as in, mm -hmm, tastes nice, but sweet as in innocent, carefree. Okay. Um, and look at it, what he sees in this last stanza. And saw it was filled with graves. Again, you know, I, I, I know why people wanted to see, yes, it's a memorial service or funeral service. I can see if we look at it just like that on its own, you might be tempted. There's a more darker, sinister idea of them just, again, death and destruction is implied. Some people have suggested because of the French Revolution and the conscription, all the deaths that occurred because of England's part, forced participation in the French Revolution. Yeah, there is, um, I think that that is valid. Um, not so much because of the funeral sites but, or the, the funeral gatherings, or it's a funeral itself happening, but rather death is what is symbolized, death of the restrictions, death of, of, sorry, not of the restrictions, of the carefree life, of the life that should be, death of those ideas, I think, is what is more important. And tombstones where flowers should be, okay, this idea of where the flowers that should be. What is replacing, where flowers, innocence, carefree. Again, look at, look at the positive words, like green and sweet flowers, and note no, the flowers repeated here. With the flowers should be, it's been replaced. Okay, and so again, innocence is what is being killed, and due to the restrictions. And this is where I really get my 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 ideas around is the sense of the priests in black gowns. Note the kind of again, the, given a sort of almost a sinister edge to it, um, or bleak or gloomy. Okay, um, as those they are in their restrictive elements, they're controlling everything and binding with briars. Now, there is a biblical image also around um, Jesus with briars and the thorn, crown of thorns. And that you can read further, but I just want to look at the b, b the harsh b, like repressive, um, controlling and restrictive and controlling my joys and desires, controlling my freedoms, my natural will to... Um, um, uh, live my life fully. Okay, this note will be also on the PowerPoint that accompanies with it, and it's just a summary again of some of the ideas around instinct and around um, these prescriptive rules. If you get the idea of the kind of um, prescriptive restrictions, this weird prescriptive and restrictions, that's really what I'd like you to understand with this. Thank you very much.